Well, welcome everybody to today's Talk with Doc. Uh, excited to have you all join us. Today's talk is on behavior basics. And we're honored to be joined uh, by, uh, to have, I should say, uh, Sabrina Mitchell join us. Um, Dr. Sabrina Mitchell uh, join us. She's an autism behavior specialist and excited to have you be with us. Sabrina, why don't you just take a minute and tell everyone about you and and thanks so much for joining us. Sure, I am so delighted to be here. It's a great thing for me to end my week with. I really appreciate the, the invite, Doc. Um, I have been a lifelong special educator. I, um, my younger brother has developmental disabilities and so grew up um, lining up chairs in the living room like a classroom and putting him and stuffed animals in the chairs and making sure that they were learning things way before um, way before I had the opportunity to, um, to actually have any formal training. And so I have um, been a special education teacher for years. Um, then I met a few kiddos that um, had autism whenever I was in my early years and was um, really, really impressed with their uniqueness and um, how interesting it was to try to get into their world and, and figure out what worked best for them. So I kind of started turning my um, specialty area that direction and ended up um, doing some work at KU, um, working on my PhD in autism where I did some consulting in school districts and things like that. And then went back to the school systems where I, I could have stayed as a, um, as a professor, but I have a, a real love for public schools and making sure that we're building capacity for um, people to be able to serve individuals well. And so um, started uh, kind of a center-based program for students with autism and managed that for a while and then moved into more of a consulting role where I went out and helped teachers um, with kids with behavioral issues or programming for students with autism or just students that had more complex programming. And yeah. so that's currently what I do now um, as a full-time job. I have a part-time job that I do social skills classes for middle school and high school kids um, on the spectrum or that just have social skills deficits, which um, I'm finding is actually probably even more of a passion of mine. Sometimes I can have some really, really hard days at work um, and I'm thinking, I don't really want to go to social skills class. I walk in, I spend an hour with those guys and I come out feeling like a different person. So um, I've got, I'm blessed in that fact that uh, the extra thing that I do actually seems to be kind of a little bit of a, of a self-care thing that I do too. It, it kind of helps me even out stressful times and that kind of thing. Um, but my passion is working with kids and making sure that they are as, as successful as they can be and that they are able to meet personal needs. Families are able to, um, to meet goals and things like that. So, um, and I really love behavior and helping people understand how behavior works and how we can help people to be a little bit more functional um, and again, meet personal goals. Yeah, it's perfect. Well, um, first, before we dive into everything, just wanna remind everyone, if you've got any questions today, we'd love to take your, your questions live and, and let the expert Sabrina help answer them here um, for you. If you're on Zoom with us, you can put them in the chat and we'll get them for you. Um, if you're on Facebook, just put them in the comments and I'm following both and we'll be able to get those and, and get them on here uh, for you. So uh, with that, you know, uh, what was a, a couple, two, three months ago that, uh, that we, I got to meet you and talked and, and I, I, I love just, you know, your, the way you think about behavior and behavior is always one of the biggest thing, whether you're a parent, whether you're a ministry leader, behavior is always there. And so, you know, I think, you know, as we were talking, I think just, again, going back and hitting the basics. Um, obviously, we all know prevention is always the best thing. But let's, let's just, Ken, what are our basics when it comes to behavior? And I think you've got some slides you want to share with us. So you can share your screen whenever you're ready. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll just turn it over to you and share your okay. heart. All right, absolutely. So I put together, and as Doc said, I put together a really, a really simple set of slides um, to kind of go through some basic basics of behavior, but I'm always a proponent of answering questions as we go. So if anybody, if I say anything that somebody needs some clarification on, don't hesitate to ask, because um, that may take us in a better direction than where my slides ever could. So I'm more than willing to do that. So here's what we're gonna start with, is here's a little bit of, um, 
kind of what I have planned for today is just behavior functions. So functions of behavior are basically why do people engage in behaviors that they engage in? And then we'll talk a little bit about how do you change behavior? So how do you reduce problem behaviors and how do you increase appropriate behaviors? And then what are some general supports to have expected behaviors? So what are some systems that can help? And we're gonna talk a little bit about reinforcement using visuals and a really simple reinforcement system, which is token boards. So we'll just jump right in. One thing that I tell people is that behavior always serves one of two functions, to get something or to get away from something. So um, me getting up and going to work every day serves the function of me getting money and getting a paycheck. So I'm wanting to get access to money so that I can pay my bills and those kind of things. Um, sometimes um, whenever my alarm goes off in the morning and I snooze my alarm, in that instance, uh, that behavior of me snoozing my alarm is that I am getting away from or I am, I am avoiding getting up and getting going in the morning. So when you want to think about behavior across the board, whether we're thinking about kids that we serve, people that we serve, um, whether we're talking about our spouses, um, is that behavior always serves, there's always a reason why people are engaging in the behavior. And if we can look at why they're engaging in the behavior, that's going to help us figure out how we can help reduce negative behaviors and increase positive behaviors. So let's talk a little bit about um, behaviors that we engage in to get something or to get access to something. The common places that you're going to, that people are going to want to get access to something is the first one that's really big a lot of times with kids is attention. So um, it, kids are probably going to want attention maybe from peers or maybe from um, their parents or maybe from a, from a preferred adult. Um, one thing that I love, if you don't want to talk about it, don't post vague statement, uh, vague, vague status updates on Facebook, fishing for people to ask you what's wrong. So there's an example of somebody that's an adult that is, um, you know, posting something like, oh, what an awful day. Hmm. That's not just to get it off your chest. It's probably to get people to ask you, oh, what's going on? Or for people right. to say, hey, I'm here for you if you need that. We all do it. I have absolutely done it before too. So nothing, not that that's a bad thing, but it's a, it's a great adult example. Um, so a lot of times kids will engage in things that get, um, that get adult attention. Something that people need to keep in mind is that um, even negative attention, even if you are reprimanding or saying, I need you to stop doing that um, and those type of things, sometimes for kids, any attention is attention. And so it doesn't matter whether it's that they're getting reprimanded or they're getting told to stop doing that. Just getting that attention and somebody to pay attention one-on-one one -on -one is going to um, give them what it is they're trying to get out of the behavior. So that's something to keep in mind when we're looking at, at students that are um, and individuals that are kind of wanting some more attention from people. Another area is to get, get access to things and activities. So um, I think about young kids a lot of times will engage in behaviors to either get toys that they want or to be able to keep toys that they want that maybe we're asking them to stop playing with. Um, they might be looking for wanting um, to, I know at my house, a big thing is watching um, shows. My son loves to um, get on Disney Plus and watch shows on Disney Plus. My daughter is a big um, uh, Team Umi Zumi fan. If anybody knows about that oh, yeah. show, I had no idea it existed. There's, um, and so, being able to get access to things and activities um, is another area. And then another area is being able to gain sensory input. Um, so we might have kids that are kids or individuals because um, needing sensory input could happen um, whenever you're older too. A lot of times um, as we grow and develop, individuals find a little bit more um, functional ways of getting sensory needs met. Um, but if you think about uh, as adults that you know or people that you interact with, we have people in our environment that are pen chewers that um, constantly have pins in their mouths or people that are always chewing gum uh, or that are always putting candy in their mouth. 
I've had um, friends and colleagues that I've worked with that are that are kind of leg fidgeters, where their legs bounce on a regular basis. So those are kind of some some behaviors that we do to get some sensory input, and a lot of times that's to keep ourselves alert and that's to keep um, us engaged in what we're doing. And for younger kids or some kids that might have limited language skills or or have quite a bit of delays. Sometimes they're just trying to get some, some oral motor input. Um, they might be, some, some kids really, really crave some deep pressure squeezing. And so some of their behaviors might be um, they're smashing into, into things to try to get that deep pressure feeling. Um, I will say that a lot of times, um, most of the time when I'm doing behavioral problem solving, sensory input to get sensory input alone is not usually by itself. Usually it has some other component to it. So students might be trying to get some sensory input, but then within that, they're getting some sensory input, but then they're also getting some attention from people whenever they're engaging in that behavior. As I say that, very seldom are behaviors that people engage in for just one function and that's it, there's nothing else. Um, so unfortunately, what we're talking about today is I tried to make it as simple as possible and stay with the basics. But of course, it's a really complex um, complex thing that sometimes isn't as easy as it seems like it is too. Uh, so as we go forward too, um, I, will, I will preface with, I will try to answer as many questions as possible, but if anybody throws me an extremely complex or like, a question about someone that's having um, extremely dangerous behaviors, I'm going to say that I probably can't answer that really well because I don't know enough information um, for that going forward. So that's kind of our start for the getting something. So now let's talk a little bit about getting away from something. So there are some behaviors that we're going to do to get things, and then we're going to be there are going to be other behaviors that we do to actually escape or avoid um, different things. So attention again. So there might be kids that are trying to do things or individuals that are trying to do things because they don't want people to talk to them. They don't want people to interact with them. They don't want the spotlight on them. Um, I've found that I need to kind of work on maybe a little bit. I, I don't do that great when I'm complimented. Um, I don't, I, I like to deflect it and be like, ah, thanks, but you did whatever. Um, so that's kind of an example of sometimes some behaviors that I, I might engage in because I don't really want that spotlight. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'd like for somebody else to have that mm -hmm. spotlight. So that th same thing can happen with people that we serve um, and younger individuals too. Again, Things or activities. So one of the biggest things that I've seen is that individuals, a lot of times um, kiddos that have to do homework at home, that there's a lot of avoidance of doing work at home. Also um, doing activities that parents are asking them to do. So like doing chores, um, doing some of those more non-preferred things. We have some kiddos that really struggle with hygiene, um, um, being able to brush their teeth appropriately. Um, being able to take a bath and change their clothes. Now, those might be the activities themselves, but then that also brings up the sensory part again, that sometimes we may be trying to get away from things that are causing sensory discomfort. So we're gonna do things that end up avoiding that, that sensory discomfort. Um, so in all of those different things, there, there are different activities that we might want to get away from too when it comes to maybe being in large crowds. Maybe if there's a lot of activity that's happening in those large crowds. I've had students that have a really difficult time in the lunchroom because there's lots of noise, there's lots of activity happening, or there are certain things that they just hate, like using um, worksheets or writing, um, or maybe they absolutely um, can't stand whenever it's cheeseburger night at home, different things like that. And again, like I talked about before, those things might be the thing that they're avoiding, but they also might be avoiding the sensory part that comes along with that too. Right. For a lot of students. So there are also what we call the ABCs of behavior. So every behavior that happens has an antecedent, which is the A part, a behavior, the thing that the person does, and a consequence. So the antecedent is what happens before the behavior. So it is the behavior, it's what triggers the behavior. And then 
The B is what is the behavior that the individual engages in. And then the C is what happens after that behavior. So it's the outcome or we call it the consequence. Now, sometimes people think about maybe the consequence that as adults, we might impose on a child or an individual that, that we're, um, that are, that is in our care. That's not necessarily the case. So a consequence could very easily be, um, one thing that I was, that I'm thinking of, I have a two-year-old at home. So we have plenty of behavior that we are navigating on a really, really regular basis. Um, so I think a lot about how, when she, um, is asking me for chocolate, right when I get her out of her crib in the morning. Um, and then I say no. So the antecedent is that I say no chocolate and there is wailing and crying, which is the behavior. And what she's hoping is going to be the consequence is she's hoping that I'm going to go to the cabinet. I'm going to get the chocolate and I'm going to give it to her. Now let's all get real that there have been plenty of times, even though I have a lot of training that I have went ahead and given her whatever it is she's screaming about just to get her to stop crying. And so as somebody that has a lot of training and is also a parent, there is no shame in that whatsoever, because there are some times that you have to just function and you have to just make it through the situation that you're in. You just have to be careful that you don't stay there and create a bigger problem that you can't fix later. Um, Now, that being said, then too, they get a little bit more mad whenever you decide that you're going to, you're going to hold to your guns and not deliver um, the next time too. Another example that I had with my son when he was younger is um, his antecedent would be that I would open the car door to put him in the car seat. And so the minute I opened the the car door to put him in the car seat, there was a bunch of screaming and and fighting and kind of smacking me and those kind of things. Um, So I always had to look at like, okay, what happens after he does that? Well, there were some times that I would shut the door and I would take a couple of minutes and try it again later. Well, what that ended up doing is that actually ended up strengthening that to where he was going to cry again because I shut the door and I stopped and I tried again later um, so that he could escape being able, having to get in the car seat. Um, So just as an aside, um, one thing that is really helpful with behavior is a lot of times when you want, uh, when you want um, someone to do something that's a really, really non-preferred is pairing with that something that's really desirable. Um, so what I started doing with my kiddo is he really, really loved fruit snacks. So it started being, okay, whenever we get in the car seat, we get a fruit snack. If we are able to get in the car seat without smacking people and, right. and screaming and yelling and those kind of things. So I'm kind of jumping a little bit ahead to how do we manipulate things? Um, but it is, we, we need to control those A's and those C's that happen around behavior. And we need to make sure that, um, that what our, the people that are in our care are wanting to get out of that behavior, that they don't get it for inappropriate behavior, but that they do get it for appropriate behavior. And I hope all of that makes sense. If, unless there's, are there any, are you thinking doc, that there's anything that needs to be clarified there? No, I, I think you're doing good with that. I think that was a good, okay. good explanation. Um, there with okay. It. <clears throat> okay. Here's just another example of those A's, B's and C's. Um, if you're given a task you don't want to do, just start crying. They'll send you straight to the thinking chair and it's like a vacation from work. (laughs) So keeping that in mind that timeout is a a really great, um, a a really great behavioral strategy. I have absolutely used it inappropriately with my own children before, um, because I've had my, my son, um, engage in some behavior to, um, get out of eating dinner. And I found myself putting him in timeout and I was like, Hmm. I put him in timeout and he's still not being asked to eat his dinner. And so I had to kind of reevaluate what I was looking at there and what, um, what I needed to do differently right. for that too. So basically when you're looking at those A's, B's and C's, and there was a lot of more technical language with that, but you basically just have to look at what's happening in this interaction. Like what, what is causing the behavior to happen and then what are they getting at the end? So what is the payoff? What are, what are they getting or from get, engaging that behavior? And then also what are they avoiding from engaging in that behavior? So let's talk just a little bit um, about how we can allow access or escape from displaying from, from displaying those positive behaviors. So I have a few examples. Some of them are from my own home life. 
Um, so here's my first one that is supposed to represent being able to stay up later than, than your bedtime. Oh, yeah. um, so my son um, spends an inordinate amount of time um, kind of messing around, dragging his feet, not getting things done for the bedtime routine. So we have set up, if you're able to get the bedtime routine done within a certain amount of time, you get 10 extra minutes and you get to stay up a little bit later. Um, that is also more from originally, um, we started with the extra bedtime because we were having him argue with us whenever we gave him directions. So to asking him to pick up his toys and there was lots of whining and screaming and, um, and just not wanting to do it. And so we talked about from dinner to it's time to go, go to bed. If you do not argue with us about what we're asking you to do, you get 10 extra minutes to stay up at bedtime. So we get to bedtime and talk about, did you argue with me? No, you didn't argue. Yes, you get 10 extra minutes. Then within that, we also would maybe do like a special activity that he wouldn't usually get access to. So that's a really simple way to be able to use those A's, B's and C's to work in your favor. Um, Another thing is using a token board. Um, I have used, and you do not have to be high tech with these things. There have been multiple times that I have just taken a scratch piece of paper and I've drawn 10 boxes on there. And I've said, every time you, um, let's say every time you say something nice or do something nice for your sister, I'm gonna put a star in the box. Once you get 10 boxes, then what do you want? And we've also had, um, where we've earned a quarter for every dinner time that we've eaten dinner like we needed to. Once you get four, my, my kid, thank goodness, really loved, and still to this day, really loves the Dollar Tree, um, which works out beautifully and keeps my budget in check. Absolutely. Um, but there for a while, we would, um, he would earn a quarter for every time he ate as much of his dinner as we expected him to. And then once he got five quarters, so they had enough for tax, we would go to the Dollar Tree and we would buy something from the Dollar Tree. So there's different ways that you can do token boards, um, but that's an easy way of being able to give them a visual because that's the next thing that we're going to talk about is visual supports are usually extremely helpful. Um, whether you're talking about students with disabilities or just anybody in general, visuals are, visuals are going to remind us of what our um, goal is and what we're working towards. Yeah. Let me jump in real quick on the token yep. board. A um, mm -hmm. couple things. One, another great way that you can reuse it all the time. If you just, you know, you can even cut out smiley faces, little Velcro, put that on, then they can move it because they enjoy pulling it off and moving it. They feel that sense of accomplishment. The important thing with a token board, you only reward them for positive behavior and you don't take away for the negative behavior. So, you know, forget the negative behavior, but only reward for the positive. You're going to get a lot more results that way with it. Um, so that's the important thing to remember is constantly be rewarding the behavior you're wanting to see um, with it. And you're going to get a lot better reaction with it and whatever it might be. You know, I know, you know, when I've worked in ministry and, and even with my kids, it could be something as simple as five minutes of iPad time. Um, you know, something you, what you need to do, just like Sabrina said, is find something they really want. It doesn't always have to be something that costs money. You know, time on the iPad doesn't cost money. You know, they, they're always wanting to be on the iPad. We want to control it. Well, that's a way to control it. You get it if you behave, um, because that's a reward. And that works really nice hand in hand. You make a really great point. I'm so glad that you brought up about the tokens, about not taking them away. Um, and, and I think that's really huge, because sometimes the accomplishment that, that people have, have met to be able to get that token is really, really huge. And I also feel like that taking the token away almost means you're trying to erase something good that they did. Mm -hmm. And I also um, do not get, once I get my paycheck from work, nobody can take it away from me. So it's, right. that's another thing too, is like, consider it a paycheck that you're, once you give that token, you've paid them. And you can always, if you see negative behavior going forward, you're not going to give a token when you see that negative behavior. Like you said, anything you want to see more of, then you need to you need to make sure that they get access to things because of that. That was, and I'm so glad you brought that up too, Doc. Now, now I would have a time limit for it. Whoops. You know that token board can be renewed each day. It doesn't last the entire week. So you want all those behaviors in a day or maybe in an afternoon. So it's not that okay, you've got an entire week or entire month to get all of this. If they don't get it that day, that's okay. They just don't get that reward. 
The next day, let's try better. Let's work harder at getting it. We start brand new and then they work towards that. So they know they have to work again towards that. Absolutely. And I think you make a really good point about, about being realistic about how long they can go. Because the other thing too, is the younger that, that individuals are or, or the younger that their developmental um, age is uh, when it comes to how much language they're able to understand, the amount of time that they can go delaying gratification gets shorter and shorter. So as kids get older, they can, they can delay gratification longer. And I think you also need to look at like how often is the inappropriate behavior happening? And if it's happening on a daily basis, they might need to fill up that token board a couple of times a day, or they might need to fill up that token board at least once a day um, for you to be able to make sure that that, that behavior is not happening more. Real quick, really? uh, Sabrina, we got a question that just yeah. came in on, on the token board here um, with this. Mm -hmm. What do you do if they want to renegotiate what they're working towards halfway through? So let's say, you know, they're working towards the iPad, but all of a sudden through the day they change. I don't want to work towards the iPad anymore. Um, this yep. mom says that happens with her son frequently. What would you do in that case? Um, what I typically tell people is I typically tell them that it's a great idea for you to have a menu. So for you to have multiple different things that they can choose from, um, I'm not a huge proponent of making them making them stick with what it is that they chose because I know that what I'm in the mood for changes typically throughout the day. Like I may start the day thinking I'm really in the mood for the lunch that I brought and then I get to lunch and I'm like, man, that sounds awful. I don't want to eat that. I want to eat something else. Right. So I'm I'm not a huge proponent of, of holding their feet to the fire on what they've chosen, but I think allow yourself, allow yourself and them a little bit of flexibility because I think part of the problem mom's probably running into is that she feels like she's chasing her tail with what it is she's supposed to give him whenever he gets to the end of it. And there's too much negotiation. And it feels like probably that he's a, he's kind of trying to manipulate the situation more than she wants him to. So I think um, having a menu of here are the different things that you can choose from, but it has to be off of this menu. And then if he wants to negotiate something else, like if there's something that's not on the menu, you can say, you know what, we're going to put that on the menu for next time, but it's not there this time. Choose the, choose the ones that are from there. Because what you always want is whatever they're working for from that token, from that token board, it has to be highly motivating. So if he's lost motivation for that thing, it's not going to be powerful enough to get you what you want anyway. So you got to be careful with that. Great point. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, the next one that um, that I know is something that I've had to work on a lot with my kiddos and with um, students that I serve is them using their words, them being able to tell you when they need something instead of using behavior. And so um, some things that I've used is just, and not even really a token board, but maybe like some, some chips or some, um, just some tokens of some sort that you just pop in a clear jar. And it's like, every time you use your words, instead of whining and crying, I'm going to give you a chip. Once we fill up this jar, then we're going to do something else. So it's kind of the same as a token board, but it's a little bit, um, it's got a little bit more flexibility to it to a certain extent. Um, right. But always keep in mind that you want to give kids better things for better responses. So if you have a kiddo that um, whines and cries and then you prompt them to use their words and they do, it's still really great for you to reinforce them using their words. But let's say that you're struggling with your son whining and crying when he wants something to drink. And so for a while, he's been doing great with you prompting him, hey, use your words, say, I want a drink or drink, please, whatever it happens to be. And then all of a sudden, one day he just walks up to you and says, drink, please then you need to go out of your mind going, yes, you absolutely can have a drink. What drink do you want? Because he just did exactly what you wanted him to do without any help from you. And that's what you want to see a lot more of. So keep in mind that they get a better payoff for doing things better for you is a great way to go about things. Love it. One thing that I have heard from parents, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Class Dojo. Some classroom teachers use it, but there's also an option of using Class Dojo as a parent. So it's an electronic system where you put your kids in there. I have um, a, a friend from our soccer team that has um, four kids in her house, and they they range in age range quite greatly. And she has a Class Dojo set up for each of her kids, and so they earn points through that Class Dojo. And then she has a she has a store in her house 
And when I say store, it's basically, she's got a menu of here's some stuff you can buy at home with your points. And so she has, there's an app on your phone. So you can use an app on your phone or you can use it on your computer and you can award your kids points. Um, there is the option of taking away points. Like Doc and I talked about, I'm not a huge proponent of that. I think that, I think you just look at um, awarding more points when you're seeing what you want to and just um, providing as little attention as you can for inappropriate things. Um, but now there might be big, huge things that that might um, lend itself to that. But that's a great um, resource that could be on the go for you too. That could be something that you could use when you're out and about at the grocery store that's easy, that you're not manipulating a token board while you're um, driving a cart down the, down the aisle. So if you just um, Google Class Dojo, it'll take you to the website and it has a place where you can sign up as a parent. We also had a parent share that um, they like and, and use something called Class Craft. Um, oh, it's okay. Like Class jo do Dojo, um, but it's more like Minecraft or video games, and that works well Ooh. with your child. Um, and you can learn more about that at classcraft.com. Um, it's on our Facebook page, and we'll post that as well. But uh, Class, C L A S S, Craft, C R A F T. Um, so another good option, if, especially if your child likes the video game type environment. Yeah, my, my kids are really into uh, Minecraft, so I'm, I may be looking into that. That's that's a great, great new resource for me. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Um, then a next, uh, a next idea is maybe having your kiddo have a point chart. So here's the things that you want them to do on a regular basis, and there are points that are assigned to that. Um, so what I tell people a lot of times, too, are the things that they resist the most that things that are the hardest for them make them have the most point values. So that there's there's a lot of payoff for them to be to do the things that are the hardest and persevere and push through that. Um, so, and, and your point values also might reflect what's most important to you. So um, for me, like the getting dressed and brushing teeth, those have lots of points on them. And then the listening well on this one, on this example has one point. For me, I think for, for kind of how I run, the listening well might have more points. I don't really care if you get dressed or not. If you're not listening to me, that's not going to work. But this is just an example, of course. And, and you need to have what works for you and your family and what's going to work well, um, well for everybody involved, too. And everybody's going to feel good about it, too. So those are just some examples. We could, everything um, could be tailored to, like I said, to your family and lots of different ideas that are out there. You also, um, sometimes just Googling reinforcement ideas could get you, could give you some ideas. I also am a part of Parenting with ABA um, on Facebook, and that has a lot of good, um, a lot of good behavioral based strategies to use for parents that have some good research behind them too. Um, one of my biggest things is to use visuals with kids. It helps you also not talk too much because especially with people that have developmental delays or even young kids, a language is our strongest area, but it's not always the strongest area for those that we're serving. So I think it's great for people to always use visuals. This is actually a consequence map from my son um, where we talked about mama or daddy tell me to do something. And we were using this um, I believe he was like four, almost five. So he can't read these words, but the words were for me and my husband so that we stayed consistent in what we were saying whenever we were showing it to him. So the pictures are for him and the words are for the adult. Um, so this is a consequence map, also sometimes referred to as a contingency map. And again, some Google searches will give you some ideas of what some of those look like. But the red track is always the behavior that you're seeing that you don't wanna see anymore. The green track is the behavior that you do want to see more of. And the first box that is there, so on the red side, the first box that's there, I say no or I don't do what they say quickly and I have a picture of him saying no. Then I have to go to timeout. I don't get to do fun things. Mama and daddy are upset and I'm sad. So that second box that's there also needs to hit home. Here's the natural consequences of your behavior that you're not going to get access to the things that you want or you might have a negative consequence, but then also talking about how, how their behavior impacts others. I think it's important, especially in a family and a home, for everybody to understand how your behavior is impacting other people and how by no means do we expect everybody to be perfect all the time, but if you're not okay or if you don't feel okay, it's okay, 
but you, but it can't absolutely completely impact the entire household to where everybody else feels um, badly also. Then the green track says, I say, yes, mama, or yes, daddy, and I do it. If I do that, then I get to do fun things like watch TV, read books, or play with toys, and everyone is so happy. Um, now, when I, when I talk about using visuals too, it's important for us to make sure that we use them a lot as a preventative. Like Doc said earlier about how prevention is really, is really key, um, but we're going to use it as a preventative on a regular basis to remind them of these are the consequences. If you stay on the, green, on the red track, then here's what's going to happen. If you stay on the green track, then here's what's going to happen. I've had several kids that we've used this and you bring the consequence map up map out to review it to them and they hold their hands up and they cover up the red track and they don't even want me to talk about it which means that it actually is making sense to them it's exactly um they right. know that that's not where they want to be and then we also talk about okay what kind of things do you need to do to stay on the green track so in that conversation you might have a kiddo that's working on some coping strategies or working on what are some other things that they need to do to be able to stay calm and and to be able to be safe in their home. And that's a great place to say, yes, we're gonna stay on the green track. What are our things that we do to stay on the green track to be able to remind? Then it also can be used as a, as a reactionary thing whenever things don't go like we anticipate, but it's still a good anchor, not only for the kids, but I feel like for the adults to stay consistent too. Um, this is also a visual that is used in my home um, for my two-year-old where um, she is constantly wanting to watch Team Umizumi on our Echo show, and we talk about how we don't get to watch that until after we eat dinner. We have to eat dinner first, and then we'll let you let you watch it. And so I um, had her pick out these pictures, and she chose both a girl and a boy version, and um, then I will pull it out when she asks for Team Umizumi. I will pull it out and say, what did we talk about? And she's like, eat dinner. And I'm like, yes, eat dinner first. It does. I'm going to tell you that it doesn't always happen. And it doesn't always work, um, but I do think that I've got a better chance of her, um, of her being able to do what I need her to do because I've got that visual to remind her. Then just another example that I have is just having a, a bedtime routine or like if there's a routine in your house that you want the kiddo to do, having a visual routine of what you're wanting them to do. Um, one hack that I've started doing with my kids too, is we have struggled, um, during bath time of all of the different pieces of bath. Like, um, we got to rinse our hair and then we got to wash it and then we got to rinse it again. And then we have to wash our body and all of those different things. So I've actually taken, um, a dry erase marker and I've actually drawn pictures on the shower wall that's in there. And then I've let them check it off as we get it done, um, to feel that like sense of accomplishment oh. that goes along with that. Um, so right that has been helpful. That's been helpful for us in art. And I'm going to tell you guys that I am not a great artist by any means. I draw some really, really weird stick figures. Um, but kids, kids don't care. They're not they Don't judge those things as long as it's fairly clear what it is that that you're trying to accomplish. Um, they're going to be able to roll with you on that. And I found too that I'll draw it. And if I just draw it and tell them what it is, it could be a blob. And I'm saying, you know, that's a that's a starship or whatever it happens to be, then they're gonna be okay with it because I told them that that's what it is. So don't be afraid to just um, do things on the fly and create some visuals on the fly that are gonna be able to help you get through maybe a tough situation. And then basically those are all of the things that I wanted to make sure that we shared. So then I allowed some time for questions and I'll just go ahead and stop sharing my screen too. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've, we've got a question uh, one of the questions is, um, uh, I'm curious about students when, and this is going to be more in the, the church ministry setting, okay. um, when they quiet down for prayer time and you have a child that has an outburst during quiet prayer, how do you handle that situation and what is helpful? Okay. I think a couple of different things that I was thinking about when I was hearing that um, that question and kind of that description is, first of all, it, the child that has the outburst during quiet prayer, do they have the capability of controlling their vocalizations to where they can be quiet for any period of time? So I think if they, I think if they can't, I the thing that I would approach is I would approach with the rest of the group um, with permission of the parents 
um, talking to the rest of the group about, so here's the thing, so-and-so isn't really able to control how much he makes noises like the rest of us. And so whenever we're having our prior quiet prayer and we're saying the prayer in our head that's his way of saying his prayer but he can't say it in his head like the rest of us do so I might use a different explanation for everyone else um, for a kid that maybe can't control that now if you have a student that can control that I think I would set up probably a reinforcement system that has some visuals about when it's quiet prayer time my voice needs to be turned off maybe they need to be doing certain things with their hands maybe their body needs to be a certain way and have a visual that's there for that and then think about what's something that they could earn for every time we have quiet prayer being able to be quiet through that prayer time the other thing that you might have to look at is how long that is because for sometimes we have really short quiet prayer time and sometimes it's a little bit longer and so looking at how long can that student keep quiet and making sure that we're having realistic expe expectations for them. And could we start really, really small that they um, are able to, to do that quiet prayer time quietly for maybe 30 seconds? And then they get a star on a chart or they get a little M&M or they get a Skittle um, for that. And then expecting them to go longer over time. Right. Yeah. And, and what I encourage ministry leaders, you know, actually develop, create a a, uh, a, a a buddy bag or a buddy box in each room that will have sensory toys, fidget toys in it. And this would be like you were saying something perfect that, you know, you can give them a little fidget toy and that might be able to be something to kind of help them focus um, during this time. Um, and just because someone's playing with a fidget toy does not mean they're not listening. Um, that actually okay. helps them focus and listen. So that can really help them uh, through that. Um, one other, you know, just kind of on some of the comments I'm, I'm seeing, a couple things I just want to make comments on. One, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this now as a parent and as a physician, it is absolutely correct and appropriate and you're right as a parent to discipline your child if they have special needs. In fact, listen to me, you are doing your child a disservice if you don't. Because what happens if you are not dis set, you have to set limits, limits have to be enforceable, and they have the child has to know what those limits are. Every child, I don't care if they have a disability or not, are going to try to push those limits. They're going to try to go beyond them. But limits are set to be there. They have to be real, they have to be enforceable, and they have to have consequences. If if they go and pass those limits, you invoke those consequences. If you don't, you're going to have these kids who develop into teenagers and adults who are horrible individuals. They think they get everything they want, and they are so difficult to deal with. I work with many adults that way because the parents have thought, oh, I feel so bad for them because they have special needs. Life is hard for them. I'm sorry, you're making life harder for them by not doing that. Um, so please think through that. Um, the the other thing, you know, with it, and I'll, I'll share some, you, your kids will understand discipline. They will understand what it means. One, one of my favorite stories is with my son, again, uh, with autism, DeRace syndrome, he's nonverbal. He had very few words, but he could say sorry his word for sorry was sar sar. And he absolutely knew when he did something wrong and he knew the consequence for it, but he was okay with that. So what he would do, he would come up to you. He'd look you in the face. He would slap you. Well, no, first back at, he, he'd look you in the face. He'd say sar sar. He'd slap you. And then he'd run, put himself on the stairs for timeout. He, and he, or he'd give you the egg timer because he knew he'd have five minutes time out, but it was worth it to him. Um, but he knew that. Um, so going through that, um, the other thing I want, especially for a ministry leader, this is one, one problem that I see happen frequently. You may have a sensory room that is, is for your, your friends with special needs and disabilities. The thing that many ministry leaders get into the mistake of doing, when a behavior happens, they pull the child out of the room 
and take them to that sensory room to, so that they can calm down or whatever. That's actually a reinforcement for that behavior, whether you realize it or not. And it's a positive reinforcement for a negative behavior. And what you'll see happening is that individual will misbehave more and more frequently so they can get time in your sensory room. So if you have misbehaviors at, at church, do not take them to the sensory room. It's absolutely fine if you want to pull them out of the classroom, but stand them in the hallway, go in a corner. Don't give them the reward of the sensory room. Let the sensory room be a reward they work for on their token board. Give them the five minutes time in that. Um, and that you'll see will make a lot of difference um, as you're, you're working through. And, and so that kind of leads in. I've got another question that just came up. Question is, do you prefer more positive reinforcements rather than negative for Sunday school teachers? I'll let you comment on it and then I'll jump in too. Absolutely. Um, okay, so there is, I think there is a, a really common misunderstanding with um, the vocabulary that was used there. So positive reinforcement um, and negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement actually means that you are removing something aversive right. for somebody to behave. So positive reinforcement is you're going to add something, you're going to give them something because they because of a behavior that you've seen. Negative reinforcement is going to be that you're going to remove something that they don't like um, based on them giving you appropriate behavior. So keeping that in mind, I am always, always going to be more of a proponent of you giving positive reinforcement or giving them access to the things that they want more than having exclusionary um, things that you use. Now, like Doc talked about earlier, you do have to have consequences and there it's okay for there to be um, natural consequences that if you're acting unsafe around other people, you don't have the option to be with other people because we have to make sure everybody's safe. So there are some natural consequences that are in there that you can use um, that I that I don't think are bad at all. The world has natural consequences for um, our behavior, both positive and negative. Um, but I think that you you are going to have stronger, um, more more lasting. Um, change by using positive reinforcement where you um, where you reward or you give access to motivating things um, from someone than you will um, than you will always having a consequence based um, type situation. Now I will say that I am much better at that in my professional job than I am as a mom. Um, there are sometimes that I rely a little bit more on those negative consequences of you know time out and losing privileges. But there's still a place for those things. I just don't think that that should be the place. I don't think we should rely on um, negative consequences and um, losing privileges as a way to change behavior. That There's a place for that. And there are parts, place, times that we might need to use those. Right. And, and I will just piggyback on that. I agree completely. Uh, piggyback on that. Ministry leaders, just because they're not your kids doesn't mean you can't set limits and you can't discipline. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can. Um, and, and so there's nothing wrong with saying no to a child and, and putting them in a timeout or not allowing them to participate in something. Um, also as a parent, I, you know, and, and Sabrina, you meant, you can't hit on it earlier. You need to pick your battles, figure out what is worth doing and allow those, those natural consequences to take effect. I can remember with my son. There were a few days he just didn't want to get dressed. Absolutely fine. I'm like, okay, fine. So he was ready to go to school. He walked out only wearing his diaper. All right. Well, it's five degrees outside. As soon as he got outside, he's like, cool, 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 cool. I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. it's cold. Wouldn't you like clothes on? And he starts nodding his head. Well, guess what? Yep. I just saved myself that five, 10, 15 minutes worth of fighting with him, let him realize the natural consequence of not getting dressed. And guess what? The next several days, I didn't have to fight with him about getting dressed. So mm -hmm. you need to learn what battles are worth fighting too on some of these um, and allow the natural consequences um, to step in and, and help there with that too. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've heard you say so many times, Doc, about... Um, 
about having limits and boundaries and things like that. And I can't agree with you more about how important that is that um, we all need boundaries. And, and as you were talking about that, all I could think about too, is that especially young people um, are craving structure and they're craving us to tell them what are the lines within which they can, they can function. Um, and they're actually going to be less anxious and they're going to feel more secure and more confident with boundaries and with limits than they would without. Because without, they're just kind of flailing around, not knowing exactly what's expected from them, how far they can go and how far they can't. And then the world actually gets more confusing because other people in their lives might enforce boundaries or, or impose limits. And that gets confusing to them about, okay, what is this? I don't understand what these people are doing whenever this, whenever other people don't too. Yeah. Um, we got another question and this is a great question. Um, she says, as a parent, many times people tell me that they see my son when he's with me and struggling. They often want to help but they don't know how to approach me and help. What is the best best method for someone who wants to help, but don't know how or if they should intervene when a parent and a child are trying to work through meltdowns or behaviors? I will tell you that um, I, I have the same thing that happens to me when I'm out in public. And what I always do is I is sometimes if it seems like it's an okay time, I will walk over and I will say, is there anything that I can do to assist you? Right. So even though I have a ton of skill, even though I, I probably got 15 different things running through my brain that I think might assist them, that may not be what they're needing or they're wanting from me. And um, I had a kiddo, there was one time I was in Walmart one day and um, I, there was a kiddo that was struggling with, and I can't remember whether it was mom or it was a caretaker mm -hmm. and he was having a really hard time not walking with her um, with the cart and, and they were trying to get out of Walmart. And I just walked over and I said, would, would you be able to let me help you? And let's have him push the cart and I'll put my hands on his hands and we'll go. And she's like, that's a great idea. And so I think you just kind of, kind of got to gauge the situation, but I think you always have to remember that, that sometimes when you see things happening out in the community, sometimes doing nothing is actually doing something. So I know that there are sometimes that parents might be out in the community and they've they've got a system that they're using with their kiddo, which is they might be ignoring that behavior because they're trying to get it for attention. They're trying to do things for attention. Um, and so I, I, I can't even imagine the feeling of being, feeling like you're being judged by people around you. So I just try to be supportive and say, is there anything I could do to help you? And they very well might have something that would help, or it might just be, nope, we just got to work through it, but I appreciate you thinking of me. Mm -hmm. And I just tell them, you know, that, hey, mama, I'm thinking of you. And I, I've been in those shoes myself because I most certainly have. And, and I think some of the time just letting people know that, that you see them and you see that they're struggling and you're thinking about them is a great help in and of itself. And that, that way they also, I, I know that when I've struggled, I've thought, oh gosh, how many people are judging me right now on what's going on? Um, and I think just just somebody showing that you care and, and you're supportive is, is help in and of itself sometimes. Absolutely. So, so this one's close to my heart. Um, and, and I love that, that, you know, this, this parent asked this question first, let me just share. If you are ever out in public, especially in society today, and you see, especially an elementary age child who is acting up, misbehaving, do not think that is poor parenting or misbehavior. Yeah. It is autism. The autism rate today is one of every 54 kids. You know what? I cannot tell you the number of times that my son Mark was having an autistic meltdown in public. And I would have complete strangers come up to me and tell me that I was a horrible parent for not being able to discipline my child. That had nothing to do with it. Or he was actually harming himself with his tantrum and I have him in a hole protecting him and I'd have police officers threaten to arrest me, threaten to tase me because they thought I was endangering my child. It's all misunderstanding. And instead, all they could have done is exactly that you said, hey, is there anything I could do to help? That's so much better. Um, and that's what I do now. When I'm out, I'm like, hey, I see you got your hands full. I'm here if you need any assistance with anything. And I'll even share, go further. You know, I've got a lot of background with special needs. I understand. And a lot of times just a parent hearing that takes weight, you know, to know that they're not being judged because all parents with children with special needs, when that is going on, our immediate thought, because it's 
real. Everyone that's watching us is judging us. And, and it's an embarrassment and it shouldn't be because it's life, but it's our life, but it doesn't need to be an embarrassment. And we need to feel sorry for the other people because they don't understand, um, but it's an education uh, with that. So great thing there. I'd encourage them to, to think through and, and uh, talk with that. Um, I think we could go on for another couple hours. We're coming up on the top of the hour here. Um, a lot of praise out here for you, Sabrina. Um, you know, they're saying that you're speaking to their soul. Um, oh, as that, and and uh, also others are saying uh, they love when when uh, parents and people say supportive things when out in public instead of criticizing. So that's my hope that everybody would be able to to you know say more positive things. It's it's my, my key word is perspective. We need to change our perspective and see what's going on um with things and and just realize that um but real quick let me just share some of the upcoming events and then i'll just uh get let sabrina give us a parting shot um with things um a couple upcoming things i want everyone to make sure that you know about um first our next talk with doc we're going to take a couple of weeks off uh we've got uh one of the reasons is may 7th and 8th we are doing our first in-person respite our Sorely Art Needed r and is coming back. It's going to be May 7th and 8th over in Lee Summit. So we are welcome, happy to be doing that. We'll be out at Abundant Life Church out there. We still have spots open for participants. If you want to participate, go to soarspecialneeds.org to sign up. We need volunteers. If you want to help bless a family, transform their life, come soar with us, come partner with us. We'd love to have you. But the following week, then May the 14th, we will have our next talk with Doc. It will be, uh, my ho my guest will be Jarrell Roche, a great friend of mine. He's up in Nebraska. He is going to be talking on how to be present even with a busy schedule. And this is going to really be geared towards dads. So moms, make sure you, you get your husbands on, get dad on to see how we got to get dads involved. And even though dads may have a busy schedule, we can still be involved with our kids. We can still be involved in, in treatment and therapy and everything going on. So uh, Jarrell's got a lot of wisdom he's gonna be br bringing. He's also a comedian. Um, so I promise it's gonna be a lot of fun. There's gonna be laughs. You do not wanna miss that. Uh, registration will be going up for that. Um, either later this afternoon or tomorrow, whenever I can actually get that up. So be watching that. Um, also, July the 19th through the 23rd, we have our SOAR camp, Soaring for Gold. It's going to be in person, but the following week will be virtual. So anyone from around the world can join it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's Soaring for Gold, an Olympic theme camp. And we'd love to have you partner with us. Love for you to be there for our in-person camp. We have one spot left one spot. That's it. So you can sign up by going to soarspecialneeds.org um, for that. We have many spots for the, the virtual one. Churches, we'd love to partner with you. Have your entire ministry join and we'll set aside a special time just for your ministry. We can do that with you. We need volunteers for all of that. and We'd love to have you. The last thing I've got, we've got some great friends who are doing a fundraiser for us. Next weekend, May the 2nd, not sure if you can see us, it's the Sloth .3K run. Even I can do this one. It's literally walking around a building one time. We'll have a wheelchair division. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's in town at 103rd and Metcalf. Um, the M80s, which is one of the Kansas City's biggest 80s bands, they're going to be out there performing. Uh, your registration gets dinner the concert. There's going to be an auction. There's also then going to be a t-shirt, a medal. You cannot miss it. If you can't join, do it virtually. Have a lot of fun with that. Um, our, I'll po post the registration. Uh, you can find the registration as well by going to our webpage, soarspecialneeds.org, and our registration for that's on the, the main page for that. So please come out and, and see how you can partner there. We'd love to have you. So with that, Sabrina, any last parting shots you'd like to leave with our, our families? I think one of my favorite sayings that um, people in the behavior world have said is that behavior goes where reinforcement flows. 
So if you want something to happen more often, pay attention to it, give it special activities and things like that. And so be very discerning what behaviors you're giving attention to and what behaviors are resulting in those activities and make sure they're positive behaviors. Yeah, no, that's so good. That's so good. All right. Well, guys, this has been fabulous. Um, the other thing, we also have our Wonderfully Made conference coming up and we're taking speakers for it right now. So if you're interested in being a speaker, you don't have to have ever been a speaker before. We'd love to have, have you consider speaking with us either in person or virtual. You can also find out about that on our website um, there. So wonderfullymadekc.com uh, or sourcespecialneeds.org. And we'd love to have you there with that. Um, Sabrina is going to be one of our speakers uh, at the conference, sharing more on 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 all of this and, and great information on behaviors. Um, if you've got more questions with behavior that we didn't get to, go ahead and email us at info at sourcespecialneeds.org and we'll get with Sabrina and we'll get your questions answered uh, with that. But I hope you have a blessed day. Remember, give your kids a, a hug, set limits that you can follow and, and know your ABCs when it comes to to behavior, but you can do it. Um, you're not in this alone. Pick your battle and have a great day. Come, soar with us. Bye-bye.